Hey, all Scott here. If you're like me, you need coffee. Lots of it. And you probably prefer it taste good, too. Well, let me tell you about Darren's Coffee Company at DarrensCoffee.com. Darren Marion is a natural entrepreneur who decided to leave his corporate job and strike out on his own, making great coffee. And Darren's Coffee is now delivering right to your door. Darren gets his beans direct from farmers around the world. All specialty, premium grade, with no filler. Hey, the man just wants everyone to have a chance to taste this great coffee. DarrensCoffee.com. Use promo code SCOTT and you get free shipping. DarrensCoffee.com. All right, y'all, welcome back to the show. I'm Scott Horton. It's my show, The Scott Horton Show. Up next, it's Roger Charles. He is the co-author with Andrew Gumble of Oklahoma City, What the Investigation Missed and Why It Still Matters. Welcome back to the show. How are you doing, Roger? Scott, good to chat with you, buddy. Yeah, yeah, good to have you back on the show. So um, I didn't uh, I didn't recognize the name, but... Uh, when Barack Obama announced this morning, or it was announced, I guess, uh, his choice uh, to replace uh, Antonin Scalia as Associate Justice on the Supreme Court, uh, this guy Merrick Garland, I thought, huh, yeah, whatever, you know, some other, some federal judge. But then they said, yeah, he oversaw the Oklahoma City bombing case, and this oh, is supposedly to his credit. And <laughs> yes, I thought, that... Liked- Huh, they're bragging about that? What? Bragging about that. That's something to brag about because he successfully orchestrated the cover up for the first part of the uh, period of the investigation. All right. Now, that is a huge accusation. Now, whether well, there was a huge cover up there, I mean, give me a break. Uh, but now, well, explain yeah. and, and really elaborate because when I check the index in the book, there was hardly anything on him, and I know that you guys couldn't cover everything in the yeah. book, obviously. Yeah. Uh, some yeah. choices had to be made there. But so, you know, tell us everything that you think you could possibly tell us that we could need to know about his role in the cover-up of the Oklahoma City bombing. Well, he was chief of the uh, Justice Department Criminal Division at the time of the bombing on the 4, uh, 4 1995, April 1995. On the 27th of April of 95, eight days later, he personally appears at McVeigh's preliminary hearing in Oklahoma City. And in that hearing, an FBI agent, John Hersley, discusses in detail a surveillance camera that is mounted on the exterior of the uh, apartment uh, building right uh, west of the federal building. And uh, this uh, camera... Uh, and the agent went, personally went into some detail about how it could pan the length of Fifth Street, which ran to the north side of the Murrow Federal Building, and had a clear shot. They were actually using it, he says, in his sworn testimony, to see if they couldn't pick up McVeigh's Mercury Marquee in the parking lot north of the uh, Murrow Building, directly across the street, uh, before the bombing. And uh, so if they're seeing that, then we know from other surveillance tape that did get released uh, that uh, uh, they uh, certainly would have captured the uh, rider truck as it proceeded east on that street uh, from the Regency Tower building was the name of it. And uh, anyhow, so that's that's in sworn testimony uh, in this hearing, which uh, Mr. Garland uh, served as the senior Justice Department representative personally presenting the case. Now, let's stop a second. Uh, Mr. Garland is a Harvard grad, I understand, and a Harvard Law School grad. So he is one smart guy, right? And he knows he's been trained by the best in how to hold, uh, you know, how to uh, prepare for a preliminary hearing. So one cannot doubt that he and his staff went over in minute detail the testimony of all the government witnesses that we're going to be at this preliminary hearing, the purpose of which, Scott, is to determine whether Tim McVeigh can be released on bond or whether he's going to be held in prison pending the trial. Okay? So this is very important. And as a sign of its importance, Garland goes out to Oklahoma City and presents the case. So he knew what this FBI agent was going to be presenting. He knew about the surveillance camera on the outside of the Regency Tower apartment building. He knew the field division, that camera, because he is a smart attorney, and he's going to want to know all these things before he puts that witness on the stand. 
now, let's go 20, almost 21 years exactly, uh, forward in time to today. The Justice Department today is telling Jesse Trinidude in a federal court case in Salt Lake City, which was brought because Jesse submitted a Freedom of Information Act request asking for copies of the surveillance tapes. The Justice Department is saying today, no such tape exists. Well, in 1995, you had an FBI agent in sworn testimony going into detail about this camera and, and what it caught the field of vision and what they were using it for. Now, he does say at the hearing, which I find ludicrous, but he makes the claim that he personally did not look at all the tape to see the bomb go off. Now, if you had a chance and you had this up on your, at the time, VHS recorder watching it, you would stop before you could see the bomb go off? Okay, well, that's what he said. But he got by with it. That was what, what Garland said, or that was the FBI no, agent the witness? FBI hers- hersley said. And, uh-huh. and Garland is the Justice Department attorney right. who is, you know, questioning and presenting uh, his witness, FBI agent, John Hersley, to get the court convinced that there's sufficient grounds to hold McVeigh and not give him bond and release. So anyhow, Garland, Merrick Garland had to be aware of the testimony that was to be presented. And this is also when Charlie Hanger, good old Charlie, the uh, highway patrolman who apprehended McVeigh 90 minutes after the bombing, headed north toward Kansas, away from Oklahoma City. Now, let me just stop a second here and remind the audience that, you know, every other state trooper in Oklahoma is headed basically to Oklahoma City. Not everyone, but all in the immediate area, and some from pretty far off. For example, an agent down in out of Bell, Oklahoma, he's headed to Oklahoma City. All right? So uh, this Charlie Hanger says he's headed south, and then for some reason he turns and goes north. Well, as he's going north, he sees this car with no license plate. And that's Tim McVeigh and his Mercury Marquis. And he pulls McVeigh over for not having a tag. Now, this is at the time you've got this huge cloud of smoke over Oklahoma City, probably visible at that point by Charlie Hanger, uh, north of Oklahoma City. But he stops this guy with a because he doesn't have a tag on his car. And the rest, as they say, is history. Arrest McVeigh, finds all sorts of incriminating evidence and so on. Hmm. But now, there's a dash. Now, Go Roger, ahead. let me stop you there for yeah. a second, because yeah. I guess that's the first time I've ever heard it implied that it was a mysterious circumstance that he was pulled over in the first place. Uh, yeah. That hangar had just so happened to pull him over kind of a thing. Do you have any any other uh bit of evidence that would make that seem mysterious rather than a stroke of luck? No, absolutely. Uh, one of the things that uh, Hanger uh, did is he was using his personal cell phone to talk to the dispatcher. Well, why would you do that? Well, because if you use your Cooper sedan radio, that conversation is recorded and the conversation is transcribed. But when you call on your cell phone, it is not. All right. Well, okay. So as far as that goes, how does that relate back to Garland then? Okay. Well, Garland is aware of all this stuff. He's got to, he's got to be aware in minute detail, uh, of what's going to be presented. And Charlie Hanger is going to be there presenting the case to the court at the preliminary hearing on April the 27th about McVeigh and why he should not be released. And part of Hanger's presentation is how he describes his pulling McVeigh over and, uh, McVeigh having a gun and, and all this, but what is not presented at that preliminary hearing, but has come out later, is the dash camera on Trooper Hanger's car, which captures a lot, but it doesn't get turned on for some reason until McVeigh is already in the back seat with the handcuffs on. Now, what what's the purpose of having a dash cam? on a trooper's car like that. It's to capture the most dangerous moment for the trooper when he pulls somebody over, which is when he gets out of the car 
and approaches the individual he's pulled over. All right, hold it right there, Roger. We got to take this break. We got to take this break. We'll be right back, y'all, with Roger Charles after this. Hey, Al Scott here. If you've got a band, a business, a cause, or campaign, and you need stickers to help promote, check out thebumpersticker.com at thebumpersticker.com. They digitally print with solvent ink, so you get the photo quality results of digital with the strength and durability of old-style screen printing. I'm sure glad I sold thebumpersticker.com to Rick back when. He's made a hell of a great company out of it, and there are thousands of satisfied customers who agree with me, too. Let thebumpersticker.com help you get the word out. That's thebumpersticker.com at thebumpersticker.com. Hey, I'll Scott Horton here for Liberty.me, the great libertarian social network. They've got all the social media bells and whistles. Plus, you get your own publishing site, and there are classes, shows, books, and resources of all kinds. And I host two shows on Liberty.me. I on the Empire with Liberty.me's Chief Liberty Officer Jeffrey Tucker every other Tuesday, and The Future of Freedom with FFF founder and president Jacob Hornberger every Thursday night, both at 8 Eastern. When you sign up, add me as a friend on there, scotthorton.liberty.me. Be free. Liberty.me. All right, guys, welcome back. I'm Scott Horton. It's my show, Scott Horton Show. So Judge Merrick Garland has been nominated by uh, President Obama to be the new associate justice on the Supreme Court to replace Antonin Scalia. And uh, we're talking with Roger Charles, co-author of the book Oklahoma City, What the Investigation Missed and Why It Still Matters, about uh, Garland's role as a just Department official, chief of their criminal division, in covering up the Oklahoma City bombing. And uh, if it's all right with you, uh, Roger, uh, if you'll bear with me for a second, sure. I want to read this quote out of your book, and we can get okay. back to Charlie Hanger and the pullover or whatever okay. other detailed discussion yeah. uh, in a moment, if you wish. Sure. But there's uh, this is, I think, the most important part of the book, actually, well, possibly. Uh, page 328, Larry Mackey, um, and everyone forgive the government new speak and triple and double quadruple negatives and whatever in the way he phrases this. But I think everyone can understand what he says. Mackey, one of the U.S. attorney uh, prosecutors here, uh, says, if you had said to us, anybody in the room, 100 percent confident that McVeigh was alone, raise your hand. We would have all kept our hands in our laps, he said. Which is, of course, kind of a weird backwards way of saying, if you agree that we all help cover up and allow the real perpetrator, the rest of the perpetrators of the attack, get away with it, raise your hand, they would have all had to raise their hands. They had agreed to let everybody else get away with it. And as you explain in their words, as you report, their explanation basically boils down to they were afraid that if they try to prosecute everybody, then McVeigh would not get the death penalty because his lawyers would be able to say, well, Strassmeyer made him do it and he's just an innocent boy and so let him go and then he would only get life. And so that was the decision they made was to let everybody else go uh, just in order to stick the death penalty on this one guy. Could you, is that right, or could you elaborate course, upon that? Did yeah, they really believe that? That was their excuse, no, or what? No, Come on. No, that, that's partially. That's here's the the key thing is that as John Cash, who you know died almost uh, uh, nine years ago, uh, but as John Cash and Glenn Wilburn, who's been dead for about twenty, well, yeah, he's passed all too, but. As these two guys told me in 1996, when I first got into the investigation, uh, this was all about the government trying to protect informants that it had inside the bombing group because these informants were telling their handlers, who should have been passing the word up the line, all about the plans. And then the question is, well, if we, if the government knew in advance why did they not stop it? And I think I've gone into that with you before. My own view of it, Scott, is that the bombers knew they had infiltrators and turned that from a threat into an advantage and used them to pass disinformation up the line to the handlers. And what happened was a decoy truck was used, and the FBI was fat, dumb, and happy, thinking they had it under control, and that they comes in the back door with the bomb truck blows up the building with the daycare center, and they say, oh, dear, we have a problem in Oklahoma City. What are we going to do? Well, they had to contain the damage. They had to keep it to just McVeigh and Nichols, because if they went beyond that, 
then it would involve government informants. As John Cash and Glenn Wilburn told me and Don Thrasher, the 2020 producer, when we started working on this in 1996, this was a government sting gone bad. And all the evidence, and I've accumulated a lot of evidence in the last almost 20 years I've been working on this, all the evidence supports that initial conclusion that John Cash and Glenn Wilburn reached back 20 years ago. All right. Now, out of all of these guys who've been named as probably or possibly involved, um, you know, most of them Mm neo-Nazis of one kind or another, Andre Strassmeyer appears to be the one, or maybe they're more Roger Moore, maybe, uh, who... He was basically an agent provocateur, not really a Nazi, but he was pretending to be a Nazi. He was infiltrating the Nazis. But who exactly was he working for, and how can you prove it? Well, it's it's in the book, and it's in a footnote, unfortunately. But that was an editor of my co-author, a decision of my editor and the co-author to bury it in the footnote. I had a retired senior, very senior CIA official, tell me uh, in 2006 that... uh, he had personally read a document uh, at the agency, was not classified as such, but the document said that Andreas Strassmeyer was a German operative reporting to the FBI, and his information was also, of course, going back to Germany. This was a big attempt for the Germans and the U.S. government to decapitate the American radical Nazi white supremacist movement. And this was a sting they set up to do this, and it backfired. And to keep the incompetence or whatever it was that caused it to go bad, Merrick Garland and people like him suppressed evidence and hid the truth. And allowing other people to go free who were not government informants, but it did include some government informants. And so here's the part about this, if you're just hearing this for the first time in 2016, is this just sounds impossible. Man, you must be off on a red herring because the level of cover-up you're talking about, I mean, all the major networks, every major newspaper editor in America, you can't even get the Dallas Morning News to get this right or the Kansas City Star or nobody to get this right. How could it be? It's a sad commentary on the state of journalism uh, in our country and independent uh, reporting. Uh, I can guarantee you, I watched it up close and personally saw uh, ABC uh, fold uh, and, and kill a piece on Carol Howe, who was a ATF informant, talking about these guys' plans to blow up federal buildings in Oklahoma City or Tulsa six months before they blew up the Murrow Building in Oklahoma City. She actually made a trip there with a couple of these neo-Nazis, Strassmeyer and a guy named Dennis Mahon, to recon targets. This is four four or five months before the bombing. And all this is reported to her ATF handlers and to the Justice Department. So oh, and her, her handler, Finley, admits this on the record under yes. oath, under cross-examination. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. So uh, this, is, this is just a huge screw-up by the government. And guys, smart guys like Merrick Garland and smart gals like Jamie Gorelick, who was the deputy attorney general during a lot of this, uh, they were there to uh, keep the lid on it, to suppress evidence, contain the damage. And, uh, you know, Oslick Willie was able to turn the Oklahoma City bombing uh, from what should have been an impeachable offense into an advantage. And he credits it with his winning re-election in 1996. He really did brag about he it. Did. He, he did. He bragged about it. Yeah. In the, in the, yeah. So, I mean, it's, people don't realize... Just the, the degree of duplicity and dishonesty. And, to and me, it's the same as 9-11. They may as well have done it on purpose to the degree they exploited it, the shamelessness and the cynicism yeah. with which yeah. they exploited Glenn Wilburn's grandchildren's deaths yeah. for their yeah. own political gain. is It's no, unbelievable, Scott, and I yeah. remember it firsthand yeah. as it happened. I still can't believe it. Yeah, I, that's an excellent point, my friend is that the government, our government, these high-level officials, these very smart Harvard grads like Merrick Garland, used the very grief of the Oklahoma City people who who had friends and loved ones die, family members die, in the bombing, 
They use that grief to promote the cover-up. I mean, these are black-hearted, cold-hearted, self-promoting career bureaucrats, and they'll do anything. That history is clear on that point. Yep. Well, and by the way, uh, not that we doubt you or anything, but just cooperation here. The New York Times uh, has an article from uh, by Charlie Savage from back in 2010 uh, where he's happy to brag that the Oklahoma City bombing made him the man he is and all of this stuff. Uh, Merrick Garland, the new nominee uh, for the Supreme Court, is and is happy to tell the story about how you're damn right he had his hands on on this case yep. far more than anybody in his position would ever do because of yep. just how important it was. So he can't back off responsibility when he's that willing to claim credit for this case. Uh, Scott, I haven't told you this because I just did this uh, last uh, last fall. I found a document uh, which I'd not seen before, and in it, the FBI clearly states that they knew that McVeigh was connected to associates. It's, it, the phrasing is McVeigh and associated bank robbers, not alleged associated bank robbers. Not you know we think maybe perhaps. Could be, makes a flat declarative statement, McVeigh and Associated, or Bank Robber Associates is how it's phrased. Yeah. McVeigh and Bank Robber Associates. Now that's, that's in a document that slipped through. It's clear in the context of how I found it that this was a document that was meant to stay in the restricted file that the FBI does not even share with the Justice Department. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Do you have a second? I'm keeping you over time here, but um, it just occurred to me this. Um, I don't know if you and I have ever spoken about this uh, before, but it's just one of the zillion little OKC yeah. anecdotes floating around in my brain. It's something I saw on court TV once where it was the prosecution of Shane and Chevy Kehoe, yeah. who were uh, a couple of white supremacist bank yeah. robbers, and they're... Their actual gun battle, where they were taken alive, was yeah. famous because it was on real stories of the highway patrol and this and that. So all of America probably somewhere deep in their brain have seen this footage of these two guys pulled over in their beaten up old suburban and getting yeah. in a gunfight with the cops. They played it over and over and over again yeah. back, you know, a decade ago or whatever. Now, they, they weren't arrested then, Scott. They weren't arrested. Oh, no, they got later. away with that one? They got away. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They got away at that point. Yeah. Oh. Jeez, well, no, so were, I screwed my story up. Yeah. But anyway, no, so right. it's the prosecution of one or yeah. the other of those. I forget which it was. Yeah. But um, the motel manager was called as a witness. Yeah. And the motel manager testified that the morning of the Oklahoma bombing, that one or the other of the Kehoe brothers yeah. had come in and very early in the morning and said, turn it to CNN, something yeah. big is going to happen, and sat yeah. there glued to the TV the whole time. Yeah. Until yeah. and then whooped and hollered and celebrated as soon as the news came across that Oklahoma City had been bombed. Well, let me just add to that, and that is in our book. But let me just add. Oh, to Oh, is that. it okay? Great. Yeah, uh, that and this is not in the book. I don't believe that uh, the other brother has been tried in in uh, in Columbus, Ohio, and uh, so the trial, the, the sentencing has taken place. I think it's sentencing, but anyhow, the the courts just stood adjourned. And he yells out, the reporters are still there, and the judge and everybody, and he says, my brother's involved in the Oklahoma City bombing. Yells it out in court. Well, this is, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning, roughly. By noon, an assistant U.S. attorney and an FBI agent from Cincinnati, Ohio, are meeting with this Kehoe boy and his public defender. And at one point, shortly after they start the meeting, uh, the public defender is asked to step outside. He does. He comes back after a while, and there's a big smirk on everybody's face, and it's announced that uh, the government has uh, cut a deal with this Kehoe boy, and he's going to go into witness protection plan, and, oh, by the way, he's going to have conjugal visits with his wife, and he ain't going to say anything about his brother being involved in the Oklahoma City bombing. Just amazing. And then... Yeah. And then that's just how it goes, right? Where that little clip yeah. gets some coverage on Oklahoma City because there's no, 
you know, top down superseding order on all Oklahoma coverage that you're never supposed to mention any of these things. Sometimes they surface here and there, but what there never is, is the, as you said, the 2020 ABC special put together by Roger Charles, you know, explaining, look, everybody, even when Dan Rather, um, got Rick Ojeda and some of those other FBI yep. agents yep. who, yep. who, uh, were willing to go public and complain yep. that the investigation, yep. the material that they had put together was yep. excluded from the defense sure. and all that. They still didn't say, I don't think Dan rather asked him, all right, Rick, so what's it all about, buddy? Come on. You know what I mean? What, what was it? And then I talked to Rick Ojeda, uh, way back when, 2002 or three. It's yep. in the archives. Yep. And he said, yeah, you know, the investigation, that, you know, my part of it led to Oklahoma City, and then they said, great job, Rick, and then they gave me another assignment, which was as per usual, nothing suspicious yep. there, but that was the material that the defense never got, was the yep. material that he had developed immediately. Come on, it fell on his lap from a hundred different directions. That well, L.A. You know, City is what the Nazis yep. are looking for. Yeah, he interviewed J.D. Cash, and that report of the interview by Rick Ojeda of J.D. Cash is very interesting. I think it's like nine pages. And then J.D. later submitted a page and a half additional, you know, correcting a couple of factual things, but basically a damn good report by Rick. But here's the interesting thing is, one, it was withheld from the trial, and secondly, Rick didn't do this because the admin people do this. Somebody put a different case number on that 302 report of investigation. It's not the Oklahoma City bombing investigation case number. It's a different case number. So it wouldn't be filed with the Oklahoma City case file, case uh, documents. I mean, there's so many. Then Jesse Trinidu has found out that there are secret files, hidden files, restricted files that the Bureau has. Not everybody in the Bureau can get access to them. They go to special people. You know, I was in the Pentagon for a couple of tours when I was an active duty Marine, and uh, there were these special access programs. And you had to be, you had to be read in for each one. There'd be a code name for it. And you were cleared for, uh, you know, lion tamer or prairie grass or whatever the code word was. And if a message came in and had that on it before you could read it, you had to show the communications people that you were cleared to read documents related to that code word. And the same thing in the bureau. They've got people that can see everything, a few at the very top, but the average working guy and gal, they don't get to see everything. They've got their head down trying to do their job out on the street, and all this other stuff's taking place behind them. But they, most of them know that in the Oklahoma City case, they know there's stuff that was presented that was either false, incomplete, misleading. And they know, well, Danny uh, Olson called for an independent grand jury, and he was one of the lead investigators. Right. Yeah, I've got you know, the audio he, of that where he yeah, said he that on the BBC. The, the whole truth has been suppressed. Right. All right, now and let me ask you one more thing, man. I'm yeah, sorry for sure. keeping you all this time. Yeah. Uh, I really appreciate you doing this. Um, but uh, tell me this. Is there a single saved uh, J.D. Cash archive? Because uh, I never was able to really locate one, although I admit it's been a long time since I tried. And I, I don't think it. it was even ever very well organized in the first place when he was still alive. But... But no, it would be a tried. tragedy if that stuff was all lost to history, you know? No, I've got it, and I, I will make arrangements for it to go to the appropriate archive. I've got a couple in mind. Uh, and by the way, uh, you know, did you know Mike uh, McNulty? Yeah, yeah. I, I interviewed McNulty a couple. I had interviewed J.D., you know, yeah. 15 well, times Mike, or something. But I interviewed Mike, McNulty once or twice. Yeah. Well, Mike passed away in February of last year. Right. Uh, and uh, I, I hope I was able to. Uh, help uh, an attorney friend of his, Dave Hardy, from. Uh, yeah, I know Dave too. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, he, I believe, based on my recommendation, uh, that Dave was able to get Mike's papers moved to the University of Texas, uh, which oh, is where great. they should be. So Mike had a quite a extensive archive, as you know, and he paid a hell of a price. But you know, it was a guy that was so outraged by the abuse and, and uh, lying that took on. Uh, our government did after the Waco thing in April of 93. He left a successful insurance brokerage in California and devoted his rest of his life to trying to get justice for those people that were murdered yeah. by uh, our government. And for those who don't know, listening, that uh, Mike McNulty, he was the really the man, the main producer, 
behind Waco, the Rules of Engagement, Waco, yeah. A New Revelation, and The yeah. Fleer Project, all of which yeah. prove beyond any shadow of a doubt shadow the a doubt. premeditated mass murder of the yeah. Branch Davidians by the yeah. Army, Delta Force, and yeah. the FBI. Yeah. So, but yeah. anyway, hey, listen, man, uh, right, so, so yeah, do that. Put that J.D. Cash archive up there somewhere because yeah. history's going to need that. No, it's, uh, it's, I, that's where I found this document I just referred to, oh, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, it's an amazing collection. He was quite a guy. All right, well, listen, man, thank you very much again, Roger. Right, we'll talk right, again. Take care. You bet. Appreciate it. Bye. All right, y'all, that's Roger Charles. He's co-author of this book. It's not uh, it's not the hardest hitting, uh, I think, because Gumbel kind of made it a less uh, hard hitting, but I think he did it for a good reason, to try to really make it acceptable to the librarians and to everybody, to the to official people that it's okay to look within this cover. Oklahoma City, why the what the investigation missed and why it still matters. Hey, Al Scott Horton here to tell you about this great new book by Michael Swanson, The War State. In The War State, Swanson examines how Presidents Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy both expanded and fought to limit the rise of the new national security state after World War II. This nation is ever to live up to its creed of liberty and prosperity for everyone. We are going to have to abolish the empire. Know your enemy. Get The War State by Michael Swanson. It's available at your local bookstore or at Amazon.com in Kindle or in paperback. Just click the book in the right margin at scotthorton.org or thewarstate.com. Hey, all Scott Horton here for wallstreetwindow.com. Mike Swanson knows his stuff. He made a killing running his own hedge fund and always gets out of the stock market before the government-generated bubbles pop, which is, by the way, what he's doing right now, selling all his stocks and betting on gold and commodities. Sign up at wallstreetwindow.com and get real-time updates from Mike on all his market moves. It's hard to know how to protect your savings and earn a good return in an economy like this. Mike Swanson can help. Follow along on paper and see for yourself. WallStreetWindow.com Hey, all Scott here. The thing is, I need you guys to help me to get these download numbers up. So do me a favor and sign up for the podcast feeds of this show. You can choose the whole show or just the interviews at iTunes and Stitcher. All the buttons you need are at the top of the right margin at ScottHorton.org. The more subscribers I have, the more iTunes and Stitcher will help promote the show to new listeners. If you're a hardcore fan, brand new or from way back, please leave them customer ratings and reviews, too. Trying to get these wars ended.